Good evening, everyone, and happy Sunday. I cannot believe that the weekend is already over. Uh, Daniel and I were just talking. We were super excited, and we just found out it's not Friday. So, um, you know, so that happens. Anyway, we are super excited you're here and are giving your own time on the weekends to spend time with us. And we look forward to helping you um, get ready for everything that is a push. Good evening, everyone. You are happy five, Friday. let's see, five days out, right? Because Friday is the big day. Um, we are five. Five days out and we want to make sure we get everything in that we need to in the meantime so let's go over really quickly um, what we need to know tonight is our sixth session in a 10-part series focusing on unit four 1800 to 1848 this is going to be we're going to look at andrew jackson's presidency and there's a lot to say about that guy this session is going to focus on interpreting different points of view in secondary sources and political cartoons. Political cartoons are really important and we wanna make sure that you know how to analyze them correctly. Remember, if you miss any episodes, you are more than welcome to go back and check this out on the BRI YouTube channel. You can watch Parts or Whole. We're all here for you and you can always check us out later when we're not actually physically here for you. My name is Tracy Downey and I'm a high school U.S. history honors teacher and a dual enrollment professor at Ridge Community High School in Davenport, Davenport Florida, which is really itty bitty teeny tiny. It's about 15 minutes from Disney World, but we're not close enough to see the rides. So I will be working. Um, I work. I also work for the Bill of Rights Institute, who are graciously bringing this opportunity to us. So thank you, Bill of Rights Institute. Um, and it is my honor and great pleasure to represent the Bill of Rights. And it is my honor and pleasure to rep to introduce, I'm just all sorts of messed up today, to introduce Daniel Jost, who will be our expert tonight. So Daniel, if you are ready to go, let's do this. I'm ready. What's up? Can I get a what's up in the chat? What's up in the chat? What's up? What's up? What's up? What's up? What's up? How's everyone doing on this beautiful Sunday? Beautiful. Well, it's beautiful where I'm at right now. Um, but uh, hopefully it's beautiful and you're feeling wonderful right now as we get into period four, 1890 to 1848. So some, some, some good stuff going down in this particular uh, period of AP U.S. history. I've been sharing a fun fact about me in each one, except last week, I last one on uh, Thursday, I asked a fun fact about you. So here is today's Mr. Joe's uh, fun fact. Hit you with it. Uh, so years ago, I was on strike for the teachers of Los Angeles. Uh, we were protesting. And then a couple of years later, a student comes to me after they had graduated from high school and they had a picture uh, in their textbook, their government textbook, their college government textbook of my goofy self uh, protesting the budget cuts in Los Angeles and the picture, one of my colleagues at the time and a few others, uh, I was right there in the chapter about Congress, the budget and the president, the politics of taxing and spending. So I was like, man, I didn't even know I made a school textbook. I was just a dude holding a sign and the way the shadows look and whatnot. It looks like I have a really cute muffin top underneath that polo shirt. So you never know. One day someone could take a picture of you and then you end up in a textbook without your knowledge, consent, or whatever. And I don't get no money for that. I'm still mad. Anyways, ladies and gentlemen, today we are going to be taking a look. Let me kind of go back here for a moment about Unit 4. This is going to get into some of the important stuff about Andrew Jackson and kind of more importantly, ways that you might be able to use this knowledge of Andrew Jackson in period four to help you on the exam. We're gonna take a look at some political cartoon uh, for you. We're gonna be looking at some other resources and let's get into a quick, quick, quick overview. As always, the Google Slides are in the description and those Google Slides will provide you with some of the resources that'll help you out. So. I will be going quick, but if you have a question, leave a comment and I will do my best to answer it. So some big ideas for period four, just to kind of frame this, set the context up, the role and relationship between the federal and state governments will continue to evolve during this time. And basically what that means is the federal government and state governments will continue to try to figure out who has the power to do this, who has the power to do that. And of course, political parties, which are represented by politicians are going to disagree 
about the role of this government. Remember, they had just created it not too long ago uh, in the 1780s. Another big important idea is this era will experience rapid economic. The economy is gonna be changing. We're talking market revolution, territorial, our boundaries, our borders are growing. Everything from the Louisiana Purchase to some others and demographic changes. People are, ha are living a little bit longer. Immigrants are coming in as we saw last week when we talked about immigration, immigrants from Ireland and Germany. So that's a big part of this era. Another thing is sectionalism will increase during this time. And we took a look at sectionalism in our fourth uh, webinar of the series, or was it the fifth? Remember we talked about sectionalism, the causes of the Civil War, um, just, just before the immigration review we did. And then there will be, the new republic will both extend democratic rights, so people are able to vote much more than previously. It became easier to vote for some people and to continue to define and extend democratic ideals to all Americans. So, you know, what is democracy? What is representation in this new nation, this young republic? Who should be able to vote? Those debates are still happening uh, and we'll be taking a look at that. And so just in case you are wondering, various reform movements will also be around during this time period seeking to change American society. So these are some of the big ideas that we are going to be hitting today before we introduce the man, Mr. Andrew Jackson, AJ, Old Hickory. A lot of different people had different views about this man, and we're going to take a quick glimpse into him as well. So like I said, America, a very big idea in period four and during the time of Jackson, just before him, during him and after him, is this idea of America's boundaries, borders expanding. You can kind of see that happening. Uh, sometimes on a lonely Friday night, I just pull up this animated GIF, GIF if you're you know, one of those people who call it that, and just stare at this puppy and just watch the states form and then turn into two countries with the you know civil war you see right there and then boom back together. So, you know, if you're feeling lonely, feeling bored, this bad boy is gonna help you. But you could see the expansion, and oftentimes places would slowly enter the union. They 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 get put people coming into them, they would turn into territorial governments, and then eventually they would be uh, formed into the United States. Western expansion, you could see the population density in 1790. Take a look at that. The purplish, the reddish, and the orangish colors, the more dense, the more densely populated that area is. And by 1790, you kind of see where the population is concentrated. And then, of course, it is continuing to expand. And just to answer the question in the chat about period four, when we're talking about period four, we're talking 1800 to 1848. So remember, there's usually these big events and there's no difference here, 1800, think about it, it is the election of 1800, the election of Thomas Jefferson, and it goes up to 1848, which is the end of the Mexican-American War, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, or another kind of big thing is Seneca Falls Declaration of Rights and Sentiments. So those kind of like that time frame. So you can kind of see this expansion and just to kind of give you some background to that, you know, there's a lot of different reasons why this expansion is taking place. As I mentioned, there's natural population growth. You can ask your parents about this one, kiddos, but basically babies are being born. Immigration increased. Uh, you have the Irish, you have the German, you have the English. Remember, it's kind of what we will eventually call the old immigrants from Northern Western European countries, but there is this kind of increase of uh, immigration. So not only are babies being born, but new folks are coming into this country. Remember another reason for this kind of shifting population, this growing population is the transportation improvements. We get things like the Erie Canal, the Cumberland Road, eventually the railroad, choo choo. That transportation improvements is allowing the nation to grow further distances, markets are getting connected, but it's also creating debates in the country. So transportation improvements will be significant in this story. And then you have the economy changing. And this is really kind of all the way back in the 1790s and onward, 
You get, of course, the invention of the cotton gin, cotton production increased, slavery is expanding, and this is creating problems between northern and southern states. We saw that in episode five. So a lot of things going down here. Uh, and then another one, number five, is basically the threats are removed from the continent. Remember, the French get booted when Jefferson is able to make a deal in 1803, the Louisiana Purchase. You know, another threat that was removed from the continent was we fought another war against the British, the War of 1812. And although we don't defeat them, it is basically uh, pretty much a draw. The War of 1812 ends. And so we don't have this continued harassment of the British by the British kind of as much of a problem. You have a very important treaty taking place with Spain, Adams Onus Treaty in 1819, where basically we swoop up and buy Florida from Spain in 1819. And then you have a bunch of Native Americans, the resistance movements that are taking place out in the West and the frontiers um, are, are defeated. Yeah, I, I see you talking about transportation and the consequences, a lot of consequences. It's a good, good observation between transportation and, and, and this thing. Um, you can see here land loss before 1783. This map is not perfect. There are still areas that have indigenous um, settlements or indig indigenous influence. So it's not completely you know, solid like this, but for the most part, Americans had occupied these territories. And then of course, by 1850, you look at even more land being lost to native people. Once again, this does not mean there are no Native American settlements or areas. It's just largely major Native American resistance had been uh, defeated by those dates. And remember, what we see is a whole bunch of instances, and this is all the background here, Battle of Tippecanoe, the First Seminole War, the Indian Removal Act. Remember the Supreme Court case, Worcester versus Georgia, basically Cherokee Indians, you have a right to the land. And then Andrew Jackson says, nah, nah, nah. And of course, later on, the Trail of Tears. And so all this stuff is happening. And these are all examples. You don't need to know all these examples. Don't worry. Don't sit there at your computer right now and think to yourself, oh my goodness, I don't know all those Native American battles. I'm in trouble. Those are just some examples of how Native Americans had sought to resist and unfortunately uh, were unable to do so. A couple more things for you, just to give you some background before we get to Andrew Jackson. Uh, here are the locations of those particular um, battles as well. Remember, even the War of 1812, just to kind of give you an idea of causes and effects of this time period, there's a lot of reasons why we go to war. You know, we're trying to defend our neutrality, remember impressment, defend our national honor. Hey, they're still disrespecting us. We're not their colonies anymore. There's British forts on US soil in spite of the Treaty of Paris saying you gotta get those out of there after the American Revolution. The Native Americans were being armed. Tecumseh and his brother, the prophet, were supported by the British, given guns by the British, and those weapons were being used against Americans on the frontier. And remember, there was a desire for Canada amongst those politicians known as the War Hawks. And all of that um, ultimately leads to a war and then a peace treaty. And remember a big outcome, does anyone remember a big outcome or effect of the War of 1812 on the United States? What does that war do? What do we see happening after that war? I'll take a moment to let you ponder it. And if you typed in, or we're about to type in the rise of nationalism, you would be correct. Yes, the War of 1812 was for many Americans, another kind of proving point for this young nation. We happen to once again, sometimes it's called the second war for American independence. We once again prove that we were going to be an independent country. You see during this time period, cultural nationalism. There's patriotic themes in art and literature. Americans are writing about American topics, painting American landscapes, and really celebrating our own unique cultural identity rather than just copying and mimicking that, that's coming out of Europe. You know, we also see an economic nationalism during this time period. Remember Henry Clay and the American system, but even with that American system, which included the bank, the protective tariff to protect American industries and help fund transportation improvements, which was the third part of his plan, 
all of these are kind of meant to kind of bring a national togetherness to this country and to promote its economic growth. You also have a political nationalism. There's only one political party, the Democratic Republicans. Um, the Federalist Party had faded into oblivion, you know, especially after the Hartford Convention. So you see this kind of political nationalism, and this is called the era of good feelings. Even the Democratic Republicans are adopting some of the Federalist ideas. They're okay with the bank in some cases. They're okay with certain kind of broadening of federal government powers. So there will, though, be disputes during this time period. Even though it's called the era of good feelings, if this was a question about to what extent was it truly an era of good feelings, remember there's still going to be tension over the protective tariff of 1816, over the issue of slavery in Missouri, over the funding of transportation improvements. So these are just some of the things that are going on as Jackson is about to take office. Don't forget, left out of this new culture are these various groups. You are gonna see women still being expected, this idea of the cult of the domesticity. But what happens is just you see the beginnings of change going on. Really, especially with women being very active in some of the reform movements of the late or the mid early 19th century. Women play a very important role in not only women's suffrage, but the abolitionist movement uh, and even the temperance movement, which starts to really kind of grow into its own during this time. African-Americans continue to be left out often from this new national culture, this nationalism. There's pro-slavery arguments in the South developing. There's racism in the North and the South. There is discrimination across the country, whether or not we're talking about enslaved folks or so-called free, um, there are challenges. And then of course we saw some of those Native American uh, battles, wars, massacres that oftentimes occurred as well. This period though, and this is really now we're starting to get to Andrew Jackson and kind of centering in on, on what context he's operating in. Remember, it is during this time period where you kind of have the rise and the fall. And this is going to answer that question, Henry, about the Whigs. You know, you have the revolution of 1800, and that is the first peaceful transfer of power. Uh, John Adams says, basically, Thomas Jefferson, the seat's all yours. You have the Hartford Convention during the War of 1812, which for many people sees or shows the Federalist Party as being disloyal and they're already beginning to fade away prior to that. And it basically puts the nail in their coffin. And that's really where we enter into this era of good feelings, only one political party, the Democratic Republicans. But remember what happens. And this kind of really centers on the election of 1824 and this feeling that Jackson feels that there was a corrupt bargain, that he really won the presidency. He got the most votes, he had the most electoral votes, and yet John Quincy Adams becomes the president partly in his mind because Henry Clay made a corrupt deal in exchange for office. He got his guy into the presidency. And that's when you're gonna get an official end of the era of good feelings. You'll have this brief period where the Democratic Republicans um, led by John Quincy Adams and Clay, those people that had those more kind of nationalistic views are gonna be called the National Republicans. Jackson and his supporters, Martin Van Buren, for example, will be the Democratic Party. And then eventually during the presidency of Andrew Jackson, you'll see the emergence of the Whigs really by his second term. And that will be the Whig and the Democratic Party. That is the development of the second two-party system. So when you see that term two-party, the second two-party system, we're talking about the Democratic and the Whig uh, party. So that's an important thing. It's in the key concepts and you're gonna to wanna to know about that. Voting's changing due, too during this time. And what happens throughout many states is this property requirements that were standard in many of the states after the American Revolution begin to be done away with. And what you start seeing in some is universal white male suffrage. So it don't matter who you are. Um, universal white male suffrage means exactly what it says. And, and then in others, you just had to be a taxpayer. But what's important here is there is this kind of age of the common man that Jackson tends to symbolize for many people. And it really is represented by the fact that it becomes easier to vote in America as long as you were a white man at the time. 
So these changes are not clearly happening for women or African Americans. It is a uh, limited democracy, but an important development nonetheless, because Jackson is able to appeal to many of these new voters. We're almost done with our quick overview, and then we're going to kind of actually get to Andrew Jackson and see a little bit about him. Some major political things to keep in mind. I've already mentioned some of them. Remember, election of 1800 is the first peaceful transition of power. Federalists say goodbye. Jefferson takes office. Air of good feelings you know, really kind of symbolized by the election of 1816, all the way up to the Panic of 1819. You've got one political party, the Federalist Party is gone. This is symbolized by the administration of James Monroe. There are though factions within the Republican Party. So if they ask you a question about, you know, the air of good feelings, yes, there may be only one political party, but different elements of the party want different things. Um, you see the kind of formal end to the era of good feelings with the election of 1824, corrupt bargain, John Quincy Adams becomes president, Jackson's not happy. And then remember, this is all happening with this um, uh, suffrage laws, more white men are allowed to vote. And so in 1828, you're gonna see the election of Andrew Jackson, which will eventually, as we've noted, will eventually lead to the second two-party system uh, where you're going to have Democrats versus Whigs. And a lot of this is going to be about Jackson's role as president, disputes over the bank, veto powers that Jackson was using more so than previous presidents. And that's kind of some of the greatest hits of politics. And in all of this, you have growing sectionalism. So we looked last week at period five about sectionalism. And the question was, was this thing entirely about slavery? Was it just more of a 1850s issue? And remember this idea of sectionalism is particular regions, whether we talk about North or South, West kind of pursuing their own individual interests rather than the interest of the nation as a whole. And so just to give you some examples, because we've already gone over some of these in our previous sessions, you have the Second Bank of the U.S. tended to be supported by Northerners, not as much by Southerners. Internal transportation improvements were heavily favored by the West. If I'm a new Western state, I want transportation. I want the government to pay for it so that I can get my crops or people can transport more effectively. State rights supporters, people who were more on the state rights, uh, limited federal government said, no, we should not spend federal money on internal improvements. The protective tariff was something that Northerners and Southerners had different opinions about. The Missouri issue, that's a huge one. Make sure you know about the Missouri crisis, the crisis over Missouri, Missouri compromise. And then the nullification one, which was really kind of about tariffs and the tariff of 1828. And that kind of creates a showdown, threats of secession and Andrew Jackson's involved in that and then the big issue over the bank. So these are some of the sectional crises that we see happening during this time period as well. Woo, I feel like I'm going fast. I don't know, I don't know. I don't even know if, 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 if you're, you're, you're getting all this. I hope so. I hope you're like sitting there right now going, you're just doing the head nod. Yep, remember that. Oh, yep, that was, that was bad. Oh, oh yeah, wrote a brilliant essay about that last point, Mr. Joes. Uh-huh, oh, yep. All of this, just got it all, easy. I hope you're feeling that way right now. And then the last thing I'm gonna say about period four before we get to Andrew Jackson is state governments will resist the authority of the federal government at various times. So I'm trying to point out certain themes that we have touched on and show you how they're not necessarily new. You know, and I wanna just kind of take a moment here to kind of show you, we've seen these debates in almost all of our sessions. We started off, about the rise of the conservative movement. And a big part of that was debates about the federal government. We took a look at Franklin Roosevelt and the New Deal and the rise of the federal government and how um, those policies uh, ultimately changed things uh, in many ways for good and some people felt for bad. We've seen over and over again, this debate in America about the role of government and we still have it. We've seen debates over immigration. We've seen debates over lots of things. And I just wanna point out if you get a question that kind of looks at the big view, don't freak out. Just start thinking, okay, what were, what were things that were in common 
between these different kind of time periods or what was different. And so you have the North, the Hartford Convention, we've already mentioned there was a debate between the federal and state governments over the nullification crisis. South Carolina wants to leave the union, Jackson rolls up with the force bill and you have eventually the olive branch on the sword. So all of these issues are going on just as Andrew Jackson is kind of rising up in American politics and eventually takes the presidency in 1828, well, technically 1829. And then the last, last, last point before we really, really seriously kind of look at Jackson is remember the economic activities of the South and North were linked together. It's really easy to forget because there's one crisis after another, or there's seemingly like there's these, these, these disputes between North and South throughout pretty much this part of American history. But these two sections were very much linked. Southern cotton provided the raw material for manufacturing. The cotton that is grown here through slave labor is being sent not only abroad to places like Great Britain, but also to Northern factories. Those textile mills, those market revolution forces are reliant and dependent upon that cotton. So there is this connection between the North and the South, this economic connection that you need to keep in mind in addition to those disputes and fights over things like tariffs, banks, transportation, and of course, slavery. So a quick short Andrew Jackson made up movie. Hey, bad dad. I didn't hear no bell. Yeah! Boom, boom, boom. Stop, stop right now! I'm the best around! Nothing but a hammer, hammer key! I'm warning you, sir! The best around! Boom! You're the greatest! I'm the best around! So. Andrew Jackson has almost become like this mythical figure in American history. And one of the things that is fast, he's just a fascinating character um, and, and, and a controversial one. I mean, think about this guy from the perspective of just modern times. And I, I think, uh, I hope, well, well, let me just tell you, think about it from the perspective of modern times. And I'm not talking about all the the moral, ethical, racial questions, which we should definitely talk about. I'm talking about the fact that this guy hated banks and he is on the $20 bill. The most common bill when I go to the ATM to get cash, you know, the cash is this thing that like sometimes we still use. Most likely it's gonna be Andrew Jackson who pops out of that bank machine, which is crazy because the dude hated banks. Andrew Jackson is a guy that is loved by some, hated by others, and extremely kind of complicated in terms of his legacy, in terms of the presidency. And in, today, I want to kind of just focus on that. Uh, we're clearly not going to get into everything Jackson did, nor is that my intent. I want you to think about how Andrew Jackson, after the Battle of New Orleans, becomes this significant figure and rises up and really, you know, symbolizes the period for a push curriculum very nicely. And I wanna just kind of remind you um, because for me, I think our minds are all in this exam mode. When you take the exam, these four different parts, you know, each part kind of important in, in a different percent way. Part one, you got the multiple choice, 40% and then 20%. And I know for many of you, when I asked you the first, kind of day, first session, the first webinar we had, which section of this test are you most worried about? And it seemed to be most people were talking about DBQs, LEQs, essays. So with that in mind, I, I wonder, is that because you're worried about writing? You, you doubt your, your effectiveness as a writer? And that's why I focus a lot on the short answer question in multiple choice with my students. If you could get really good at those, and I, it's gonna be hard to be a great writer and teach you history at the same time. And so if you can kind of really hone in on these two areas, I think you have a good shot, even if you claim you're not a great writer, 
to do well. And so I wanna to focus today on the short answer questions with Andrew Jackson and take a look at this particular cartoon and just kind of how the questions might be on the exam. And there's a good chance you've probably seen this one. And if you have, beautiful. And if you haven't, be prepared. And let me kind of go back. The reason why I call this one short answer question two is on the SAQ, remember the second question you have, you're gonna get some sort of primary source, some sort of stimulus, and you're gonna to need to kind of answer a series of questions about it. Very often, not always, that stimulus is visual. So a cartoon, like this one, a picture, possibly. But um, question number two sometimes throws students off because they sometimes have trouble analyzing the image. So I wanna take a, just a quick moment and have you take a look at the three questions that this question is requiring you to respond to and see how you might, knowing what you know about Andrew Jackson. Because the reason why I think the SAQ does offer a great opportunity for people who do struggle as writers, that people that are maybe not as academically uh, proficient in that area, is you really, you don't, you don't need to be very well polished. You just need to know some history. And so think about all the things you know about Andrew Jackson as you look at this cartoon. And Question A says, briefly describe one perspective about politics in the 1880s, in the 1830s, my bad, expressed in the image. So what is the perspective of this cartoon? And sometimes students misread the cartoon, so you wanna be careful. So what is the perspective? So if we take a look, one of the first things I always do is look at the caption of the cartoon. So in this particular one, we got King Andrew the first, um, and we have some, some language around the cartoon itself um, of veto memory born to command had I been consulted. Okay, so maybe that helps, maybe it doesn't. We have the sourcing King Andrew the first, so the cartoon is called King Andrew the first, an image of Andrew Jackson, 1833. So if you can contextualize, maybe you know what's going on in 1833. And I happen to know that is in his second term, because it doesn't give us a month, but by 1833, he was entering in term two. He's elected in 1828. So some of the battles have already taken place between him and some of his uh, political opponents. And then if I take a look at the cartoon, I see uh, Andrew Jackson with, you know, a rather... Uh, I don't know how you would describe that look. If someone in the chat wants to kind of tell me, how would you describe that look? Is that, I, I don't know, I, I'm, I'm at a loss for words. But he's holding a veto, some sort of saber of sorts. He is dressed like royalty and he stands upon the judiciary of the United States, internal improvements, the US Bank Constitution of the United States of America. And so he's standing upon these things and the question's asking you, what is the perspective about politics in the 1830s in this image? Um, and so what, what do you make of it? What is the perspective about politics in the 1830s? What would you say if you saw this particular cartoon? It's asking you a question about politics in the 1830s. What do we got here? Okay, see Andrew Jackson, the tyrant, okay? So you might want to elaborate a little bit. I know on the chat, you just kind of want to type it away so you can get back to listening, taking notes or doing what you're doing. So this particular cartoon, you could do a number of things with if you're doing A. And if you're doing A, you might notice that this particular cartoon is making a point about Andrew Jackson, which is not positive. Now, I actually have seen some students Look at it and say, look, Mr. Andrew Jackson looks tough. He looks like a gangster. He looks like he doesn't take crap. And that may be true, but I, he meant to be a sympathetic figure. And there's a lot of different ways you could go with this. And here are just some examples in which you could, obviously you'd write them out, kind of make the point that Jackson abused his power as president of the United States. If you wrote that this cartoon 
was to, meant to say that Jackson was abusive of his power or using powers as he does not have, does not respect the Constitution or America's institutions. Jackson acted like a king instead of as a, pre a president in a republic. Then you would be on your road to getting a point. And, and really, it's important that you don't overreact to the cartoon and make assumptions. This one is more, it's, it's a lot easier than some of the other cartoons that you'll see, but I've had numerous students kind of give their view of the cartoon. And then some of their views, they thought that this was a pro Jackson cartoon, but it's not. Okay. So yes, I agree. Good job, everyone. Uh, and think also just kind of the context of this time, 1833, we're not too far removed from fighting Great Britain. We're not too far removed from kind of becoming a country. And so monarchy, remember those enlightenment principles, those ideas about a republic are very much embedded in this generation. And so to portray oneself as a monarch, especially of the olden days of Europe, um, that's basically the view. And, and there's a question, did he fully abuse the powers? And, and that's where we're going to get into kind of a little bit of a discussion or, you know, me kind of asking questions and you somewhere on the other end of the world uh, thinking about the questions or the answers to those, qu those questions. Um, part B, briefly explain one specific event or development that led to the perspective in the image. And this is sometimes students misread this. And I really get sad when he when they do because I, I feel like you got to be careful because you know it, but don't answer the question they're not asking. So why, if 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 part A is the perspective is Jackson abuses power, the perspective is Jackson did not respect the Constitution or American incident, or Jackson is acting like a king, what would be an event that led people to say this? Like, what is something that Jackson did? or something that happened during his presidency that gave people that view of Andrew Jackson. And there's a bunch of things you can do and you could say them, but it's important you link it back to the perspective. So his bank veto, for many people, the Supreme Court had said the Bank of the United States was constitutional. Anyone remember that Supreme Court case? Remember the famous John Marshall Court did a bunch of cases in terms of, you know, expanding the power of the federal government um, in the New Republic. The most famous one is Marbury versus Madison, judicial review. What Supreme Court case ruled that the Bank of the U.S. was in fact constitutional? And for some people, for Andrew Jackson to then veto this bank was seen as kind of going against the will of this new government and the way things were uh, established through previous administrations. Anyone got that Supreme Court case? Okay. His removal of federal money from the Bank of the US and placing it into state banks would be another example that you could use to illustrate the view that you see in Andrew Jackson in this political cartoon. Remember a lot of those, that money that was taken out of those state banks was given to what became known as pet banks because they were known for being loyal to the Democratic Party. And so that kind of, you know, he's giving money, the federal money to state banks that are loyal to his political party. That looks like something a king or a corrupt tyrant would do. So that's, that's another event that you could use. His ignoring of Worcester versus Georgia where the Supreme Court basically says, no, the people of the Cherokee Nation have a right to this land and, and there's protections for them. And allegedly, Andrew Jackson basically said, John Marshall has made his decision. Now let him try to enforce it or something to that effect. And there's doubts whether or not he even said it like that. But point is, Jackson ignored the Supreme Court is the view by kind of saying, I'm going to allow the removal of the Cherokee people to commence. And also just the, the fact that Jackson opposed the American system for some people was like a king type thing. Like, hey, the other presidents were kind of cool with the bank at this point. The tariff wasn't as big of a deal. Like, why are you kind of uh, blocking this progress after the War of 1812? That was kind of the view of, of especially the Whig Party. 
So all of these events that happened during Jackson's presidency could be interpreted by some people to lead to this view of Andrew Jackson you see right there. And so it's important that when you think about what you know, like for instance, today is the big one that we're kind of talking about a particular president, but it's, it's very easy to get lost in all the things that happen and kind of miss, like how does that show us something important in history? And so that's what you, what you really want to kind of be able to do. Uh, part C, explain one specific effect of the political developments by the image. So this one is kind of asking you to kind of like, what effect did this kind of thought or this kind of feeling about Jackson have? And so that could be an important thing. And you can kind of talk about any of these things. The effect of what he did or the view of Andrew Jackson as more of a tyrant. So the fact that he shut down the Bank of the U.S., took the money out, led to the Panic of 1837. The fact that he and his political opponents started to really have fierce debates around things like some of the topics we mentioned leads to the growth of the second two-party system, which will be Whigs versus Democrats. The fact that there was division over the views of things like tariffs and the role of the federal government in the states led to the nullification crisis between South Carolina, Andrew Jackson, and of course, John C. Calhoun. And then his ignoring of the Supreme Court case led to the Trail of Tears. So when you're talking about effects, this is the, the part that a lot of students have trouble with is, what effect would you say was an outcome of the view of Andrew Jackson as a king, as a tyrant? Now, I wanna try something just really quickly with this cartoon because unfortunately I started realizing with time, it's hard to kind of really dive into a bunch of cartoons. So I want to just kind of use this one particular one in, 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 in a different way. So let's just imagine for a moment on this SAQ, there was a slightly different question. And, and it's, it's asking you to take another perspective. And that perspective is, who would disagree with this cartoon? So let's look at it from a different perspective. Like now that you know kind of the perspective is this, this is who Andrew Jackson is. This is kind of what he caused. This is the effect of that cause. Who would like, what would be an argument against this view of Andrew Jackson? Um, and, and while you're thinking about it, like uh, just to answer the question in the chat, how is Trail of Tears an effect of this? Well, remember his ignoring, if we go back to B, by ignoring the Supreme Court case of Worcester versus Georgia, he is not only behaving, some people would argue, as a king, as a tyrant, as someone who's ignoring the Constitution, but by ignoring it, he is then denying that the Cherokee people have a right to the land, which then in turn leads to the removal of the Cherokee people from that particular uh, region. So yeah, um, got some quite some some things coming into the into the chat. Yeah, the Democrats um, who supported him would obviously not agree with this view of him. Some of the common people, the people who may feel like he is representing their interests versus the elite or the um, you know East Coast you know manufacturing Northern elite, um, people rewarded by the spoil system. Um, all of those are, are, are different um, perspectives of Jackson. And I just want to kind of just once again, I've been throughout these sessions talking about history is complicated. You know, remember, Jackson was a state rights guy. But one thing he does do is he lays the smackdown or at least threatens the smackdown on South Carolina during the nullification crisis. So that would be an example of him fulfilling his obligations if you want it. And I'm not saying we, we're here to defend Andrew Jackson tonight. But if you wanted to kind of look at it from a different perspective, Jackson as not a tyrant, you can argue, you know, although he was a defender and advocate of state rights and necessarily against tariffs, he wasn't an advocate of tariffs. He defended the right of the tariff of 1828 and ultimately broke away with his vice president, John C. Calhoun, during the tariff crisis and defended the federal government law over that of the states. Um, 
And so I'm, this is not here once again to kind of get you like, you know, Jackson, good, bad. That, that's not what we're doing here. It's how do you look at the view of a cartoon? This view is very clearly Jackson is a tyrant. Jackson is bad for the democratic process. Jackson did, if we look at some of these uh, examples, things that people were opposed to. But there is equally an argument by those who would defend Jackson and they would pick their own evidence. And that's really what you're doing on the SAQ. You're picking what evidence you know to defend your particular view about the question, or in this case, the political cartoon. So hopefully that makes sense. My brain's a little foggy because it's Sunday, but, but I want to be clear about cartoons and just kind of don't, don't make assumptions. Make sure you understand what it's saying so that you give an example that really reflects that viewpoint. Okay. I want to kind of pivot here to essay question number one, uh, SAQ question number one. I just want to remind you, that's the one where you get two secondary sources. Give you another example of how those sources can be uh, used. And we'll kind of use one that's slightly connected to Andrew Jackson. Well, actually very much connected. Uh, so you might get a question like this. And I want to model the process that, that I encourage you to do um, as you're reading. Because I've noticed that oftentimes students struggle with these, as we've mentioned. Um, so this is the one where you get two sources and then you get three questions right below. Um, so I found one for this period of time. And let me just kind of show you what I, I recommend. So I read the sourcing, David can't say that name, historian in the midst of perpetual feats, the making of American nationalism. Okay, he's talking about nationalism. All right, doesn't help me too much, but maybe this is gonna be about nationalism, but we don't know. Good feelings animated the American nation and the victorious afterglow of New Orleans. Oh yeah, that's the battle where Andrew Jackson won and the war was over, but still he became a national hero. He's talking about the good feelings, so nationalism. Maybe he's talking about the era of good feelings. But if this was the dawn of a new era characterized by the awakening of American nationalism, it was a most peculiar awakening. So it's questioning this idea of nationalism. Political feelings in America were truly mixed. What? It's not all, it's not all good. It's not all bad. It's like a little both. And not the least because of the remarkable effort to promote and publicize good feelings an effort that denied the continued conflicts that America's faced. So if I read that correctly, continuing conflicts, that means they're still having conflicts during this period of good feelings. Partisan and related sectional differences continued to be the most obvious obstacle to joyous unity. Oh, so they're having some beef. Parties are having beef, sectional differences are an obstacle to unity. So nationalism isn't perfect. At the same time, the dominant modes of nationalist thought and practice still encourage attempts to celebrate America into a consensual, nonpartisan future. So they're recognizing that there is this nationalism, but they're also recognizing that there is a tension, there's a mixed feelings, and it's not as pure as one would normally say. So keep in mind as you're reading it, okay, what is the big idea? So if I were to walk away right here, it's like, yes, there was nationalism, but there still was tensions that threatened the nation. That's what I get about this source. If I go to the next one, Harlow, more name that I got to move on to. Historian, the last founding father, James Monroe and a Nation's Call to Greatness, published in 2009. Yeah, I haven't read that book, but okay, it's going to be talking about James Monroe. All right, all right, well, don't really know, but greatness, okay, this idea of America is awesome. Monroe took office determined to lead the nation to greatness, making the U.S. impregnable to foreign attack. Oh yeah, I remember Monroe was like, like securing like our borders with those treaties, like the Adams-Onis Treaty. Yeah, John J.Q. Adams, like doing the Secretary of State stuff, making deals left and right, issuing Monroe Doctrine, stay away from the Western Hemisphere, all that good stuff. Okay, and enduring, ensuring the safety of Americans across the face of the continent negotiating deals with England, you know, our border with Canada and like sharing Oregon and then the Florida stuff. Okay. Monroe promoted construction that linked every region of the nation with outlets to the sea and to shipping routes to other continents. Got to build that transportation, baby. No, Monroe's promoting that transportation. He's making sure no one's going to attack us. Monroe's presidency made poor men rich, turned political allies into friends and united a divided people. He created an era never seen before since in American history, an era of good feelings. 
that propelled the people and its nation to greatness. Okay. All right. Very different view. Take, take a look at the questions. Like I said, they're usually very similar. One difference between the two people? What's one thing that the first one would say that would prove their point? What's one thing the second one would say that would prove their point? So if we were to do this question, here's a dude that's saying, yes, there was nationalism, but it wasn't all great. People had mixed feelings and there was party conflict and sectional conflict. This one is, man, everything's going wonderful. The foreign threats are going away. We've got stuff getting built. Nations coming together. It's all love. It's all love, baby. And if you were to do this, there's so many things. Let's just think for a moment how you might respond to this particular question. Basically, source one, Walter Stryker, Stryker, David, we go, he lets me call him David. David is arguing that Americans are still divided during the era of good feelings. Yes, there's nationalism, but there's still tension between different parts of the country. Whereas Harlow argues, no, nah, this, is, this, is, this is nationalism. It's all love. People were feeling good during the era of good feelings. And, and the era of good feelings represented a new era that we haven't seen since. It was beautiful. Okay. And then if you were to defend it, Think about how you could use so many different things that happened during Andrew Jackson's presidency or other presidency. You could talk about the disagreements between the Whigs and the Democrats. You could talk about the disagreement over um, Missouri. And just to be clear, Whigs don't happen till later, but that, that disagreements begin when they're all Democratic Republicans. Oh, we don't wanna build that road. States don't do that. Federal government doesn't do that. The Missouri situation, Missouri is trying to enter the union as a slave state. That's a group disagreement during the era of good feelings. All of those are examples that you could use for B, that it wasn't all beautiful and nationalism. What about green, the, 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 the greenish one? How would you defend that one? What's an example of something um, that demonstrates there was a great degree of nationalism in the country. What, might, what, what would be a good example? I've noticed on this one that sometimes people struggle because usually history teachers show you that this wasn't an era of good feelings like we make it out to be. It wasn't this harmonious time free of political division, but it was better than it's been or was before. So this one, you could talk about how there was a growth of nationalism after the War of 1812. We defeated the British for the second time, sometimes calling it the second American revolution. Um, you could talk about the growth of a national culture. You could talk about the growth of kind of the, and this is something that a lot, a lot of teachers talk about because you know, time, but the growth of American themes in literature and paintings. Talk about James Fenmore Cooper or give a name of some American author or painter maybe you learned about. You could talk about how there was construction projects uh, that helped transportation improvements, what's also helped link the country together economically. Great example right there, um, uh, the American system. You could talk about, even though there was debates about it, they still agreed enough to kind of put the American system in place, which helped promote this kind of wave of economic and political nationalism. Um, there was only one political party. The fact that James Monroe got elected and basically got all of the electoral votes except one because they wanted to keep George Washington as the dude who was unanimous and the only unanimous one. Um, there's a lot of things you can do, but I would agree part C is a little tougher because you may not agree. And this is the beautiful thing about history and why I use Andrew Jackson to kind of frame this. You don't have to agree about it, but you have to understand that there is facts that do lend itself to both perspectives being true. You may say A is way true. Like this is way more kind of an accurate view of the history. This is a sanitized version. And, and you would be correct if you're able to prove it. But at the end of the day, there's no one right answer. And so, um, yeah, the market revolution, uh, linking of trade between the South and the West, the fact that the economy, even though it's distinct, cotton, uh, textiles, manufacturing, those two are playing on each other and need each other. That would be another great example of this kind of era of good feelings and that the economy, remember early on, especially in the 1790s, we were getting punked by the British, the French, all the impressment going on. That's not happening uh, 
So James Monroe was effective at helping create peace, um, not to mention the Napoleonic Wars were over. And so that would be another way of kind of proving this nationalism was in fact true. This view that is expressed by Harlow is true. It's 456. I wanna make sure that we have some time for some questions if you have them. And so I'm gonna just stop talking here and ask thoughts, questions, comments, concerns. I know uh, we had some questions being answered in the chat by the squad here. So thank you, Tracy, appreciate that. Any other questions before we head out to enjoy the last moments of our weekend? Okay. That was an hour. Time flies when you're with the, the people you love. Time flies. Would market revolution and leaking of trade networks between West, North, and South? Yeah, definitely that would be a good way to defend the kind of unifying of the country. Most important thing about the American system, uh, I would say there's two. Um, so actually the question right below it is what is the American system? Uh, and so let me kind of hit both those together. So let me cue this up here. The American system is Henry Clay's kind of like plan for promoting the development of the economy after the War of 1812. And in that American system, it has a couple of different components. One is a tariff to protect American industry. American industry was having a difficult time competing with Great Britain. So here is the uh, parts of the American system. So to protect American industry, the idea behind that, because that would primarily help Northerners. So why would anybody else support that is the idea is the funds that are raised by the tariff um, would be used to help fund transportation uh, improvements. Uh, so the federal government would take that money that's protecting Northern industry and fund transportation improvements, which would in theory help all parts of the country, all regions, because trade would flow more effectively. Then the second part of the tariff it, or the American system is the renewal of the Bank of the United States. Remember, that was something that was debated by Jefferson and Hamilton. A lot of Democratic Republicans came to see the bank as having some value. And uh, if you watch the musical Hamilton, uh, they talk about trying to get rid of the bank even after Hamilton, and they don't because it works. Um, and then the third piece is internal transportation improvements. Um, so in terms of what you should know about it, it is an example of economic nationalism trying to get the American economy to grow. Uh, because remember, we were once a rather weak uh, nation that was getting bullied by European nations like England. Uh, and so it's an economic plan, but it also reveals that there were still debates between those who were state rights versus federal government. There were debates between the interests of the North versus the South. So it shows both things, that nationalism, but also that sectionalism that uh, we are uh, seeing. Um, my thought about the DBQ question, I think they're gonna have a whole bunch of them because they're so worried about cheating. And so they'll probably have like 17 versions, um, but I'm hoping one version will be about reconstruction. I feel like there has not been a solid DBQ on reconstruction in a long time. And reconstruction is in my mind, perhaps one of the most important things. You need to understand reconstruction to understand uh, the civil war. You need to understand reconstruction to understand uh, the need and the, 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 the reality of the civil rights movement. And so I, I, I think students study reconstruction and if it's not on the test, you still got a important topic that really kind of speaks to some of the challenges we face today uh, and to face throughout the 20th century. Um, market revolution is basically the description of the economy changing over time. Um, so we're talking about just kind of the development of industry the industrializing of the North, the growth of the textile industry. But in that also is the inventions, you know, the steamboat, uh, the cotton gin. Uh, and so it, it does lead to the North and the South kind of developing in very different ways. But like I've said, those two different ways are linked together. You need the raw material of cotton to help fuel the cotton, the textile industry in places like Lowell and other uh, places. So uh, don't get the market revolution confused with the second industrial revolution. A lot of students do that. So we're talking market revolution, 1790s throughout, you know, 
the antebellum period, everything before the Civil War, and then post-Civil War, you have the second Industrial Revolution where we're talking things like oil, steel, coal, railroad, things like that. Um, yeah, so reconstruction, I agree. Look at that. Great minds think alike. That's what's up. It is 501, and tomorrow we're going to get into some good old French and Indian War causation. We got period three tomorrow, then period two, then period one, and then we got like Q&A on Thursday. Thank you so much for watching, you all. I hope to see you tomorrow and have a beautiful, beautiful evening. It's all you, Tracy. Thank you, Daniel. It is, um, we are over our time by a minute, so I will not keep you guys. But thank you, thank you, thank you for joining us on a Sunday. I know that going the whole week and then asking you to do something on the weekend is pretty impressive. Um, shout out to the class that's on there every single night. You guys are killing it. I really, really love that you're there. Um, we are super thrilled that everybody is here. So thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, let's see what do I need to tell you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel Jost. Thank you, Bill of Rights Institute for putting all of this on. Thank you, Daniel, for being a great content expert. I will go ahead and wrap up. We will see you tomorrow. Um, same time same place and we will be doing um the next unit we are just working our way backwards so have a good night everybody we'll see you soon